Well, good morning. Uh, I'm so happy to be gathering with you this morning. Uh, If you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Drew McCullough and I'm on staff here in our student ministry. Uh, And if you've been watching online during this quarantine, uh, you have probably seen my face. Uh, You've seen me run around my house like a crazy person uh, screaming at the top of my lungs during the two minute countdown for our clubhouse and Kid City experience. Uh, Don't worry, I'm not gonna be running around on stage screaming at the top of my lungs lungs, you can keep your volume right where it is. Uh, But I'm excited to be here this morning in a different role as we continue our series uh, in in the book of Psalms uh, this morning. And when, when Pastor Will came to me and asked me to teach this morning, I told him how I kind of went back and forth with some different uh, passages, some different chapters here in Psalms, and I felt like the Lord kept pushing me to Psalm 86. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn to Psalm 86, or if you have your phone, your iPad, or tablet, whatever, uh, you can Google it, it comes up, or you can use the, the Bible app, uh, all, all the same. But Psalm 86 is very interesting because Psalm 86 is actually one of only five Psalms that are labeled as prayers. And last week, Pastor Will uh, walked us through Psalm 90, which is a prayer of Moses. Um, but Psalm 86 is known as a prayer of David. And David, that's, that's the boy who killed Goliath, went on to become the great king of David. David wrote three of the five prayers in the book of Psalms. But Psalms 86, it's a little bit uh, special. See, uh, a lot of scholars believe that Psalm 86 was not actually written for one specific occasion, one specific uh, moment. Uh, th- many people believe that Psalm 86 is actually a prayer that David prayed often, that he prayed on many occasions, that he actually uh, offered as a model for others uh, to model their prayer life. And it's actually kind of seen as a uh, Lord's Prayer of the the Old Testament a little bit. And and so scholars actually uh, say that this Psalm 86 should not just be called a prayer of David, but they say that it it might as well be called the prayer of David. David. And so uh, I want to take a look at Psalm 86, and we're going to go ahead and jump in here. I love Psalm 86. Let's jump in. Verse 1. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you answer me. And then he busts out into worship here, verse 8. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You are God alone. This is kind of reminiscent of these uh, New Testament passages that say, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord. And then here's one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. So pause there real quick. Here in verse 13, he says, you have delivered my soul from Sheol. And he makes, he rhymes a little bit. He's a poet, he couldn't help it. But he says, you have delivered my soul from Sheol. Now, to tell you what Sheol is, uh, actually a few weeks ago, 
Pastor Will on Easter Sunday uh, went into depth about what Sheol, Sheol is. So to save a little bit of time, Sheol was basically a holding place for the dead before the resurrection of Jesus. And so what, what he is saying here, he, he, we don't know if he's speaking figuratively, if he's speaking literally, but what he's saying is, God, you have saved my life. You have rescued me because of your steadfast love. And then he goes on, verse 14, he finally tells us what's bothering him. Oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life and they do not set you before them. So he tells us what's troubling him. But if you know anything about King David, uh, there was many people throughout his life that were after him. And we don't actually know who he's talking about here. Remember, this was, a, this was a prayer that many believe was a general prayer that he, he prayed often. And so this is a, a general statement of adversity so that, so that you can take your adversity and, and struggle or suffering and put it in here in verse 14, whether it's mental or, or emotional or spiritual or physical. And he goes on, in verse 15 is, is very special. Let's look at verse 15 real quick. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So in verse 15, now these are not, they're beautiful words, but they are not the words of David. See, verse 15 is actually a quote, almost a direct quote uh, from Exodus chapter 34. In Exodus chapter 34, Moses is in the presence of God. Moses just took the Ten Commandments. He saw the Israelites in idolatry and sin, threw them down in anger, and had to go back for another copy. And so he's in the presence of God. And God uses these words to describe himself to Moses. Look at what he says in Exodus chapter 34. He says, the Lord, the Lord, talking about himself, is a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So what David is actually doing here is he is quoting God's words about himself right back to God. He's saying, God, this is who you say you are. I'm coming to you based on your own words. And, and it's actually really cool because David, this is, a, this is an incredible discipline that David is practicing here is, is, is praying God's words back to him. If you've ever wondered like, I mean, I don't really know what to pray in this moment. Uh, just FYI would be awesome. And a great discipline to practice is to quote scripture and pray scripture. Um, so he, he, he quotes God's words right back to himself. And then he closes out in these last two verses. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and, the, and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see me and be put to shame because you, Lord, you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. It's a beautiful prayer. It's a beautiful, I love Psalm 86. I love David's prayer here and I, I love the simplicity of it. Right? It's, so, it's such a simple prayer. But I also love the depth behind it. And that sounds kind of contradictory, but I think that's where the beauty is found is it's so simple, but it's so profound at the same time. It's full of of honesty. It's full of just crying out, full of emotion. And actually, as I was was, was meditating on this and digging and studying, uh, one commentator pointed out that that Psalm 86 is not like other uh, psalms that David wrote because most psalms uh, that he wrote, they are poems, they are songs. And so they have this this, uh, poetic structure. They have this logical flow to them. But this one is full of spontaneity. It's just all over the place. 
right? He's praying about one thing and he breaks into worship and he prays about something else and he breaks into some more worship. And it's just, it's just like this roller coaster and you can see straight into the heart of David. And I think that's what's so beautiful about it. It's such a beautiful prayer. But see, when it comes to prayer, it, prayer is one of the most critical and crucial things in our spiritual life. But it is also one of the most confusing. Pr prayer is one of the things that, again, so simple, but it's so complex. And, and there's questions. It's one of those things that, that it's simple, but we have all these questions about it. Like, I, I don't, I, what do I say? How do I say it? When do I say it? And sometimes we, it's like we don't even understand the implications of prayer. See, prayer is a privilege. Prayer is a privilege because can you believe that, that the creator of the universe, the one who made the stars, the one who gives you breath and holds it all together, that God, that creator invites you into communication. Prayer is a privilege, but it's also very puzzling. And so because this Psalm is seen as the prayer of David, a model prayer. I wanted to look at this prayer in its entirety and see what is David, what is his prayer showing us about our own prayer life? And so what I want to do is I want to use this amazing dry erase board and uh, draw some stuff out for us. And I want to invite you to take notes at home, uh, draw this out with me, uh, but forgive me that you're going to have to look at my back a few times and see my half mullet I have going on. Haven't had a haircut in a while. Uh, so we're going to look at what David's prayer looks like in Psalm 86, but we're also going to look like, look at how we treat, how we view prayer, how we pray. And we're going to see what, the, what, that lo that what they look like next to each other, side by side. So when we look at David's prayer here in Psalm 86, David shows us how to pray in many different ways. And the first one that you see, it, it slaps you in the face as soon as you start reading it, because it's right there in verse one. Look at verse one. He says, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. He says, God, I am poor and needy. I'm poor and needy. And then he, he calls himself a servant and he goes on uh, crying out for grace, pleading for grace. The word plea just in, insinuates, it gives a picture of poor and needy. But see, sometimes when we come to God in prayer, we don't come to, oh, I didn't write it up here, I'm sorry. He taught us how to pray in humility but when we come to prayer, sometimes we come to prayer, not in humility, but we come to God like we are deserving. We come to God like we're deserving. And we like, we kick in the door and say, what up, God? I'm here. Listen to my prayer. Hey, God, I just read your word. I did my part. Time for you to hear my prayers. God, I've been pretty good lately. Here's what I need. And David, David says, no, no, we pray in humility. We are poor and needy. But he doesn't just show us how to pray in humility. Look at verse two. It says, Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Now, if you look at that, my, the way I did the first time I read it, I was like, dang, David, you acting kind of desert, you're kind of demanding of God. But that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's doing. What he's actually showing us here is how to pray in intimacy. How to pray in intimacy. He's not saying, hey, I've been good. Hear me. What he's actually saying is, God, 
I am godly, I am holy, I am your servant, I'm one who trusts in you because you are my God, because you have set me apart, because you have started a good work in me and will bring it to completion. You have already shown me grace in the past, and so I know that you will show me grace in the future. God, you are full of intimacy. And it shows this bond of love that they share, this bond between them. And he even says, when he says, you are my God, it's this, this, this personal pronoun, this my God. And then down in verse four, gladden the soul of your servant for to you, O Lord, do I lift my soul. He says, God, I come to you for joy because I know you are my source of joy. This intimate relationship, it's honest. He's, he's, not, he's not afraid to come to God in humility because he has this intimate relationship. But so often, instead of coming in intimacy, we come to God and we, we come and we feel like we have to be guarded. We feel like we have to be guarded. I, I, uh, I, look, I know how poor and needy I am. I, I don't want to talk about how I'm really feeling. I don't want to talk about what I'm really thinking. God, you don't want to hear that. God, I'm afraid. We, when we approach God more in fear, and, and you might think like, uh, you know, you don't fit in this camp, so you fit in this one, or you don't, I, I've, I've gone back and forth, let's be honest. Depending on the day, depending on what's going on, I have walked up to God felt feeling deserving. I've walked up to God completely guarded and ashamed. But David says we come to God in intimacy. And he paints a beautiful picture back in verse one. Throw that back up again. He says, incline your ear, O Lord. Incline your ear. See, if we come to God guarded, it paints this picture of like, uh, I'm gonna hide my face, maybe God hear me. But knowing that David and his intimacy with God, his, his love for the Lord, their relationship, knowing that he is the one that said that, it paints a completely different picture. It paints a picture of a, of a, of a child crying out, to his father, dad, dad, help me. And the dad just kind of stooping down and what do you need? What's wrong? It's this care, it's this intimate love bond that David shows us here. So he shows us how to pray in humility, pray in intimacy, but also pray with consistency. Look at verse three. He says, for to you do I cry all the day. All day I come to you. God, I don't give up over and over and over again. God, I pursue you. I come to you. I cry out to you. He's saying we come to God. We pray in consistency. We are consistent in our prayers. But how often do we care less about being consistent and we care way more about convenience? We care way more about convenience. I, I got a few minutes. Let me, let, me, let me do my prayer for the day so I check that box. You know what? We get, how, how often do we get to the end of the day and we look back and we say, man, I know that whole pray without ceasing thing. I, man, I was just so busy today. I didn't have time. And, and it, what's, what's, what's crazy to me, and I do this too, is we, we fill our schedules, we fill our day, we fill our lives with so 
Many meetings, meeting on meeting on meeting on meeting on meeting, uh, PTA meetings and, and sports meetings and meetings with friends and family meetings, all different kinds of meetings. But the one meeting that we continually neglect, that we continually push to the side is the meeting with the Almighty, the meeting with our Creator. And it's all about convenience when it comes to our prayer life. I'll, I'll talk to God when I have time. I'll squeeze it in. But David is consistent with his prayers all day long. God, I come to you. I cry out consistently, Lord. See, the, the meeting that that he prioritizes is the meeting with his creator, the meeting with the one he is intimate with. And it's not just that it's his priority, it's the one he continually pursues. Consistency. But then he shows us in verse seven how to pray in faith, how to pray in confidence. Look at verse seven. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you for you answer me. Look at that confidence there. It's not an arrogance, it's a confidence. And, and it's not a, in, a confidence in David, it's a confidence in God. God, I call to you because you are good and you listen, you answer me. But I don't know about you, but when I look at my prayer life, I don't always pray confidently. A lot of times, I pray a little bit differently. I pray with uncertainty. I pray with uncertainty. I, I pray, ah, God, are you really listening? Or, okay, that was dumb. Of course you're listening. You're God, but God, do you care? And we pray with these half-hearted prayers where we, where we come to God, but then it's just like, are you really going to do anything? And we don't pray with confidence. We pray with uncertainty so often. So David, so far, he's taught us to pray in humility, pray in intimacy, pray in consistency, pray in faith. And if none of these over here have hit you in the gut, these last two will. Because he then shows us how to pray in adoration. To pray in adoration. He bust, remember verse eight, and ten, 8 through 10, he just bust out into worship. You are God alone. No one stands a chance against you. No one is your equal. All these other nations around us, they think they have figured out who God is, but their gods are just statues. They, they don't hear prayers. They can't do anything. God, you are God alone. There is no one, nothing like you. You are unparalleled in perfection. You are unparalleled in power. Your works are unlike any other. God, you are God alone. And, and just over and over again, it's this worshipful, this worshipful prayer. David spends way more time talking to God about God than he does talking to God about himself. But how often do our prayers, instead of adoring the King of Kings, how often are our prayers self-absorbed? Self-absorbed from the top to the bottom of our prayers. Me, 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 me. It's my money, I want it now. It's all about me. And David is showing us, no, it's not. It's not about us. Prayer is much uh, less about us and more about the one that we're praying to. He, over and over again, he says, your, 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 you are, you are. 
And yes, you know what? He does lay out his needs and he prays for God to deliver him and preserve him and and listen to him. But if you look at what David says about himself, it's not just balanced by, it is completely outweighed by his amount of worship for who God is. All throughout the passage, David says, pray in adoration. Don't pray when it's all about you. And here's the last one. He shows us how to pray in surrender. Look at verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. See, he comes to God and says, God, (laughs) don't just give me wisdom so I can figure out my own way. He says, God, teach me your way so that I can walk in your truth. When it says in scripture to walk in, it doesn't just mean to act a certain way. What, it, walking in pride doesn't just mean, oh, I did a prideful thing. Walking in pride means pride permeates my entire life. So David is saying, God, teach me your way so that your truth can permeate every part of who I am. My thoughts, my actions, my emotions, my purposes, my plans. Your truth. And then he says, unite my heart to fear your name. God, I am poor and needy. I am broken. My heart is divided. My heart is hypocritical. Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. Unite my heart to worship you alone. Unite my heart to your heart. Let your purpose and your desires be my purposes and my desires. Let what you love be what I love. Unite my heart. Complete and utter surrender. I don't know about you. I don't just often come self-absorbed. I come self seeking. We walk up to God in prayer and we say, God, here's what I need. Pull out our pad. And we say this, 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 Uh next, this, this, this. It's all about me. It's not just self-absorbed. God, I want it my way. God, give it, give, give, give me what I think is best. You know what? I, I know your, your word says this, but like, I'm not really sure that's the best way. Let my way be done. Let my purpose be fulfilled. God, this is what I think is best. Don't teach me your way. Give me the strength to do it my way. And it's all about self-seeking. And we go to God like he's a vending machine half the time. I think today God... There's my bill, D7. Completely self-seeking. But David says, no, we come in utter and complete surrender. Now, I want to mention this. There are these two camps when it comes to prayer a lot of times. And there's this camp up here with pray in faith, pray in confidence, right? And, and, they, and they say, you know what? We need to pray boldly. We need to pray confident because God is able and we believe he will do it. So we just pray boldly and pray confident prayers. And then this other camp is down here saying, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. No, no, no. You, only, you just pray, God, let your will be done. And they constantly butt heads. But I think that the, where, where the magic happens is when these two ma- marry, when they come together. That's where I think the beauty in prayer is found. It's God, I know you are completely able. You are God of God. You are the only one. God alone, all powerful. But God, my heart is divided. 
My heart is hypocritical. God, my heart is sinful and broken. And I often think my way is the best, but God, I know your way is. So Lord, let your will be done. It's a both and. So David shows us how to pray in faith, pray in surrender, adoration, consistency, intimacy, humility. And when we step back and look at these, and we look at David's prayer that he prayed often, and we look at our prayer life, and I don't know about you, but I mean, you, I'm sure you may not fall into all these categories, but uh, if you're like me, uh, one or maybe uh, all of them, many of them, pop out to you and uh, really hit you in the gut and convict you this morning. And so as we look at these, we ask, what is it? Why, why is David able to pray like this? Why is my prayer life so much like this, so contrary to David's prayer? And here's what I think. I think that David knew and remembered what you and I often forget. And it starts back in verse one, but continues through the entire prayer is he knew he was poor and needy. He knew how, how, how broken he was in, in comparison in the presence of the perfect, holy creator of the world, infinite, unparalleled God. God, I am poor and needy. I am broken. I am helpless. I am nothing. See, David knew his brokenness and he knew that, that the only chance he had was a miracle, an act of God, the intercession of grace. He knew his need for grace. Look at one of my favorite pastors, Paul Tripp says about grace. Grace is for the willing, and we only become willing when we confess not only the gravity of our sin, but our inability to deliver ourselves from it. Not just when we see the gravity, but when we see our inability. Not just when we see we are poor and needy, but when we see that we are completely uh, unable to be self-sufficient. You and I are not made to be uh, independent. We are made for dependency. And David understood that, his need for grace. And so my question for you this morning is, are you poor and needy? Do you see your need for grace? Not, not just grace for yesterday, not just grace for today, but grace for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Do you, do you see your neediness? Do you see your need for grace? Because David did. And that's why David knew I'm poor and needy and he knew his only hope was to run to the God who, as he prayed in verse 15, but it says, uh, God said about himself in Exodus chapter 34, he said, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means Clear the guilty. David knew his only hope was to run to that God. And here's the good news for you and for me. The good news for us is that we don't just get to pick up God's word and read the words that God described about himself. We actually get, got to see, we get to look back on those words being fulfilled. We actually get the benefit of seeing those words become flesh in Jesus Christ. That's what we get the benefit of. The, the, the gracious, merciful, steadfast in love and faithfulness God became flesh 
and pay the sin debt for the poor and needy. He paid the sin debt for the poor and needy. The perfect embodiment of grace became the perfect sacrifice for your sin and for mine. And the one who is completely deserving gave it all up for you and for me to die on a cross. And he, though we deserve shame, he took our shame and went exposed on a cross for you and for me. And, and talking about time, he, he came in just the right time to save us and redeem us. And he is completely uh, not self-absorbed and not self-seeking. He said, Lord, I don't want to be, I don't want to go through this suffering. I don't want to be beaten, but Lord, let your will, not my will be done. He went through with the father's plan for his eternal glory and our eternal good. And on the cross, his prayers were ignored so that our prayers may be heard forever. That's grace. And the grace found in the gospel of Jesus Christ changes everything, including our prayers. So you and I, we have to begin looking at prayer through the filter of the gospel. We have to view prayer through the filter of the gospel. Because it's only in grace we cry out for grace. We are poor and needy. Because when we look through prayer, through the lens, through the filter of the gospel, we come completely broken. We know our sin. God, you are perfect. You are unparalleled. I am humbled in your presence. But I know that Jesus Christ won intimacy for me. And God, I consistently come to you because you will never forsake me. And I can pray in faith and pray in confidence because the scripture tells us that it is by the blood of Jesus Christ we can approach the throne of grace and mercy. And we, can, we just spend all day and night adoring the one who gave it all for us. And God, it is your plan and your way and your purpose that saved me from my condemnation. So God, I surrender it all to you. It is helpless for me to try another way. That's grace. The gospel and the grace found in the gospel changes our, not just our entire lives and how we treat people, but it, it, cha it changes our prayer life. See, prayer is a privilege won for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And my prayer for you this morning, for all of us, myself included, is that we become more aware of our poor and needy souls in need of grace and grace alone. It, it, my, my, my prayer is not that you go and try to pray like David. My goal is that you fix your eyes on the gospel this morning. Fix your eyes on grace. Are you poor and needy? And this morning, if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, man, I, I would love for you to have a conversation with someone, whether it's a trusted friend that you're worshiping with this morning, or you can uh, text High Point to 97000. And you can have a conversation about what it means to give your life to Jesus. Or if you have questions about anything else we've talked about. 
Well, but if you are a follower of Jesus, whether for one day or 100,000 days, my prayer this morning is that you would come to see your need for grace today. That you come to understand your need for grace more than you did yesterday. And tomorrow you see a greater need for grace. Because as you grow in your, your understanding of your need, you grow in complete adoration and surrender and humility at our God who saves us and abounds in grace and love and steadfast faithfulness. Let's pray. Holy God, incline your ear to us for we are poor and needy. God, I pray that you be with everyone tuning in and gathering right now, God. I pray that you remind us of our brokenness. Remind us, God, of our poor and needy souls. Not to tear us down, but that, God, your grace may pick us back up. For, Lord, we give our souls to you. We lift our hearts to you because, God, you are the source of joy. Teach us your way, O oh Lord, that we will walk in your truth. Unite our hearts to fear your name in your name only. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.